Let me start off with uh, panel number one today. Uh, this is our first panel, then we'll be breaking for lunch. Uh, but uh, companies successfully using manufacturing technologies today. Our moderator today is Dr. Dave Cranmer. He's a senior researcher at NIST and uh, part of the MEP program. Uh, he says uh, several key successes in his time at NIST, including managing development of a marketing assessment tool for uh, use by the MEP field staff, uh, training courses in marketing for field engineers and marketing specialists, and introduction courses for the MEP system, so very heavy into MEP. Um, in the technology product development areas, he is uh, developing an integrated set of products and services to help smaller manufacturers more rapidly and cost-effectively use R&D services. Um, I'll let him introduce the panelists. Uh, with that, uh, Dr. Kramer, please. As Rob said, my name is Dave Cranmer. I'm with the National Institute of Standards and Technology. For those of you who don't know, NIST is the nation's measurement laboratory. So if there's something in the physical sciences you have to have measured to the smallest degree possible, come talk to me, because we probably have a world-class expert in every one of those sciences somewhere in our system. Um, we're also the host for the National Manufacturing Extension Partnership, which means we are the co-funders of both CMTC and Mannix, as well as the Arizona MEP, who has several representatives hiding in the back, so if you need to talk to them, they're here as well. Uh, we are also now the host for the National Network of Manufacturing Innovation Institute's National Program Office. Um, you heard earlier during the USC presentations about their unsuccessful bids for DMDI and several other institutes. Uh, the President's plan certainly calls for a lot more institutes, so there's a lot more opportunity for you to propose something that makes sense for those. Uh, and as my former, now former boss, Pat Gallagher, who was the director of NIST, said, the innovation institutes are really the nation's attempt to recreate institutions like Bell Labs and RCA, excuse me, RCA Labs, which we have managed to lose over the last several decades. But there's a, a gap in that research to commercialization base where the innovation institutes are intended to fit. Um, with that said, let's find my page down. Uh, the panel today is going to talk about companies that are successfully using manufacturing technology to keep their businesses competitive and profitable. Uh, the, we've got four panelists, Nikhil Parchure from Complete Coachworks, Larry Nichols from New Tech, Ken Rakusen from Gordon Brush, and Peter Athanas from CMTC. Each of them has a unique story to tell about their manufacturing operation from Nikhil's. We take old buses running on diesel and recondition and reconvert them to electric and other means. Um, New Tech does e-beam and ethylene oxide sterilization which requires some fairly unique technology all by itself. Gordon Brush manufactures some 15,000, if I remember correctly, different types of brushes, of which about 2,000 are standard catalog items. And Peter, bless his heart, is now a manufacturing consultant for CMTC, but ran his own job shop in Massachusetts for a number of years. So has both an inside and outside perspective and is going to help us wrap this up when we get there. This is the setup. Um, in spite of what Mr. Wong may have said, manufacturing still matters a lot in this country. We may think it's still not where it needs to be, uh, but certainly there's a recognition in Washington and some other places that we need to support it. It needs to be part of the nation's portfolio of things that we do. It matters economically. It certainly matters to our national security. Uh, I don't think we can afford not to do it. Step two, if your company's not growing, you're probably dying. That means you need to be looking constantly for new opportunities for new products, new services, new combinations of those, new manufacturing processes that make your operation continually competitive and profitable. I think it's clear to everybody in the room you're not going to compete on low-cost labor. There is no such thing in this country. 
Um, and there are lots of places where that low cost labor can be found and used. So the sooner we get past that, the better off we will be. And finally, the smart investments in technology are the requirement for success. So let me turn it over to Nikhil and Complete Coach Works. So Complete Coach Works is a Riverside based company. Just wanted to give you a brief background about company. Uh, it's uh, established in Riverside for past 27 years, caters mostly to the transit bus and heavy duty uh, vehicle market. Uh, Complete Coach Works has been serving transit across Canada, North America, Mexico, even we have done some work for African countries. So it's pretty diversified customer base across North America. Uh, main business for Complete Coach Works has been for past many years been diesel to diesel remanufacturing, conserving the old chassis, using reduce, reuse, recycle, and rebuy policies to sustainable uh, product deployment. And in 2012, we started the new initiative for electric bus manufacturing, where we take old diesel buses or CNG buses and convert them to completely all electric battery powered buses with more than 100 mile range. Uh, and now the new generation bus that we are launching will reach 130 to 150 mile range. And we have developed a lot of technology and I like to talk about it uh, once we go through the introductions and, uh, and we'll also like to have uh, answer your questions if you have. Thank you. Hello, um, New Tech Corporation is a contract sterilizer for medical devices. We were founded in 1990 and struggled for 13 years before finally breaking even. A uh, very large capital investment in medical device radiation sterilization. Um, and in 2003, when we did break even, we realized that we needed to do more than just service our customers the way everyone else does. We have um, changed our tagline to sterilization by design. So we will actually design sterilization for customers that they might not be able to find elsewhere. Uh, one of our customers is based out of Germany that they claim that they went to every sterilization contract sterilizer in the world and we were the only ones that could figure out how to do sterilize their product for them. And we have also, in the last year, decided that just using electron beam radiation as a sterilization method was limiting us. So we decided to put in ethylene oxide, or ETO, and everyone in California has always said you can never put ethylene oxide in Northern California. And we fought with the city of Hayward uh, for over a year and a half to try to finally get that um, authorized by them, and we've installed that. Hi, I'm Ken Rackison with Gordon Brush. Gordon Brush has been in business since 1951. As Dave said before, we have uh, we make over 15,000 different brushes. But the main reason I think that I'm here is because we spend so much of our effort and so much of our money on buying new automated equipment. When uh, the comment was made earlier about if you don't grow your business, you end up going out of business, I'm 100% believer in that. And we probably spend between probably 15 to 20% of our revenues every year on acquiring new equipment because I'm a believer in if you, in our case, buy it. But if you buy it, they will come. If we buy the right equipment, we will get the right customers and we'll continue to grow. Um, uh, one of the things that I learned a long time ago, and by the way, I have a, a master's in, in business from this university also, uh, just coincidentally. But I didn't learn it here, but I learned it from another person in my industry, in the brush industry. But he, he told me, he said, if you always make sure you invest more money in new equipment than you're writing off in depreciation, your business will continue to grow and you will succeed. And honestly, like one sentence made such a difference into the way we run our business because from that point forward, I started to invest and invest and invest. And everything we invest in is very automatic, very, very sophisticated, uh, very specialized, where we can produce so many products with one person per shift. I mean, I can produce uh, you know, certain types of brushes 
uh, up to 30, 35,000 brushes a day with one person per shift. And as a small business, to make that investment is a lot of money. But that's the kind of thing that helps us grow and be very successful, even though we're in California. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Peter Athanas from CMTC. My story, as Dave uh, had mentioned, goes back to uh, Massachusetts, where I was uh, one of three siblings that ran a family manufacturing company. And uh, back in those times, I go to networking events and seminars like this, and uh, they would talk about business development and technology and things like that. And I would, I would come out of these seminars equally excited and petrified at the same time. What we're talking about here can be very scary. We're talking about new technology. We're talking about how to integrate it into your facilities, how to integrate it with your customers. And there's a lot of unknown. And the best thing that we can do as a first step is embrace the fear, because that fear will lead us to, to asking intelligent questions and getting the right answers that will mitigate that fear, that will allow us to embrace this technology and use it to our advantage. So if any of you are feeling like I felt several years ago hearing some of this stuff, it's very natural. There, this, is, this can be frightening, but if we do the right things, if we follow a plan, if we bring in the right information, then we can, we can mitigate that fear with research and the things that are gonna tell us that whatever we're gonna bring into our facilities are gonna be the right things and we're gonna commercialize them properly to be profitable. Great, thank you all, I appreciate those introductions. Nikhil, let me come back to you to the extent that you can. You know, we had chatted on the phone a bit about the kinds of technologies you had to invest in. Talk a little bit about the kinds of things you had to make the investments in, what led you to do it, and the kinds of things you had to think about before you put the money in place to do it. Complete Coachworks has been around for 27 years, and our president, Dale Carson, has always been on the forefront of new technology. Uh, CCW was the first company to do a install of a CNG uh, tank on a transit bus, and so Cutting edge technology has always been the focus area, and that's why in 2012, uh, the whole uh, electric vehicle uh, revolution kind of thing was happening, and uh, Dale at that time decided that uh, electric is a pretty good way to go forward, and then we started investing. I joined the team from uh, my previous company. It was an electric drivetrain company, AC Propulsion. I came from there to here to uh, help in the electrification program. And we started investing in specialized battery module designs, uh, uh, motor specifications and manufacturing, uh, fabrication of different assemblies because we are dealing with uh, old transit buses, so we had to be adaptive and uh, even 3D printing technologies, that helped us a lot because we, we were trying different uh, battery designs and we needed fast prototyping abilities and 3D printing was uh, one way to reduce the cost of a design and uh, deploy that on a quick turnaround basis. Our first electric bus deployment, we finished manufacturing in less than four months, and that is possible only with the aid of new technology that we have today. Uh, without that, it's very difficult. Um, so basic specific focus areas have been uh, drive system, uh, battery technology and integration into existing chassis because we don't have a lot of freedom with the uh, existing chassis. And I think those are the three key areas where the mm -hmm. investment was made in uh, manpower, uh, technical training, and also uh, vendor kind of participation. We pay a lot of NRE costs, non-recurring engineering costs to vendors. Th those are based in Southern California to uh, expand their facilities and also uh, get the right product for us as a, uh, as from a component supplier. One yeah. of the things we had talked about was just the difference in the sizes of the chassis. Oh, yeah. And, and talk yeah. a little bit about how that line has to be modified yeah. to work so you can do what you do. Yeah. So the transit bus, I don't know whether you guys are familiar with it. There are three, four different types of transit buses that are available. Uh, one is a 40-foot that you see plying on the roads every day. Few are 30-foot buses, which are shorter chassis to accommodate in a congested areas. They 
uh, they run in a smaller uh, congested areas. And that changes the whole design uh, because you have a 40 foot with more space and now you have to put the same drive system in a smaller chassis. So we had to do a lot of research in a module, mod modular design of the components. So the battery pack that fits in bus with 40 foot can also fit in the bus with 30 foot, can also fit in bus with 25 foot, which is difficult because there are different dimensions, uh, different uh, tolerances that you have to uh, consider. But um, modular and standardization of a component level helped us to easily ramp up if a demand comes from a 30 foot bus, uh, then we will easily divert our components there and we won't waste time in redesigning the components again and uh, using the uh, commonality as a, uh, as a tool to reduce time and cost. Because the more we buy, the cheaper it gets. Even in the batteries, the more we assemble in one ship, the cheaper the cost goes in the uh, cell level and a module level. And uh, we wanted to have that commonality so we can, um, as you all know, the volumes are really low in the electric vehicle or electric bus industry. And this is a new, uh, new product for the market. So we wanted to make sure our costs are low. And that's why we use uh, common component platforms. Great. Thank you, Nikhil. Let me ask the same sort of question of Ken about the kinds of things that were necessary for Gordon Brush to invest in. Well, as I was saying earlier, when uh, it kind of dawned on me after that other gentleman told me this uh, about investing, um, we started to, our, our growth actually grew very significantly because we started to buy more machinery even though we didn't necessarily need it. And we didn't know we needed it. So we'd buy these machines that were fully automatic and after we get it running, and all of a sudden, we realize the, the machines are, they're, they're, they're full. They, they have no more capacity. And we go, how do we survive without the machine? Because before, we were doing fine. Now we are very, very busy. And then it uh, leads us to buying a second machine, in some cases, even a third machine. And I, I look at them, and I go, how did I make money? How did I so survive? How did my business develop before we had these machines? And in each case, we just keep buying more and more machinery which helps us grow and grow and grow. The interesting thing was when we first started on this growth, which was 1993, 94, when we started to do this growth, our people were afraid as we bought new machinery because they thought they'd all be laid off. That's where we replaced them with is automation. Of course, it turned out to be the opposite because when we bought more machinery, we got more business. More business meant we needed more people and we continued to grow. So what they were afraid of back in the beginning was, you know, the opposite actually came true. Um, right now, as we speak, as I'm speaking here, I have two machines that are both coming from Italy, actually. One that's another brush manufacturing machine, and one is, um, it's called a CNC router. So we make so many custom products that we're always looking to make something faster. Well, this new router is going to allow us to take four by eight sheets of wood or plastic or aluminum and do all the machining all at one time on this, you know, off of this four foot by eight foot uh, sheet of plastic or wood or, or aluminum. We used to cut those up into small pieces and put them into one of our machining centers. Now we're eliminating again that extra labor that we were doing before. And I know that what will happen is, um, I'm going to say later on that I should have bought these machines 20 years ago because we would have been more efficient then, but we didn't know that. And then the other brush making machine that's coming in, it's fully robotic. Uh, one operator per shift will be able to make over 1,000 brushes an hour. And um, you know, to me, it's a half million dollar investment, actually about $550,000 investment for that one machine. But if I don't buy it, I lose ground to competitors. I lose ground to those people in that China. Remember that, all those graphs about the Chinese stuff there? We make everything in America. I have a facility 12 miles away and another one that's in Wisconsin. I don't import anything. I, I make it all here, and I want to continue to do that. In the medical device industry, 15% of medical devices are sterilized with e-beam, what we've historically done. About 35% with gamma, and 50% of medical devices are sterilized with ethylene oxide, or ETO. And we saw that there were a number of products that we could not sterilize, and we were turning business away on a weekly basis. 
So we decided that if we put metal, uh, ETO facility in the Bay Area, that we would be able to capture all of the Bay Area medical device uh, manufacturing. Just to let you know that almost all medical device companies use a contract sterilizer. They don't, very, very few of them actually have in-house sterilization. So they rely on companies like ours. And the problem with putting ETO in the Bay Area was that there are no ETO facilities in the Bay Area because it's just has been a known fact or, or supposition that because of Bay Area quality, you could never put one in the Bay Area. So we, for, well, at first I convinced the owners to invest a million and a half dollars to install this operation. And then went to the city of Hayward and they took 15 months for from the time we applied for a permit till they actually granted us a permit to put in the ETO. Um, and it, it was just amazing to have to go through that with the with this city that supposedly wants jobs and wants to keep businesses in the area. So that's where we're we are right now. The ETO is we're finishing the the qualifications of the machine this Friday, and we will be validated and be able to sterilize with ETO on Monday. Ken, you had mentioned that you're reinvesting about 15 to 20 percent of your revenues per year in new equipment. Nikhil, Larry, do you have ballpark percentages of what you're putting in of your revenues per year? Ours is an extremely capital intensive business. When we put in, we moved from one facility to another um, seven years ago, our initial facility cost $3 million, and the facility we moved into seven years ago cost $6 million. And like I said, we're adding a million and a half dollars worth of ETO right now. And unfortunately, our building's being taken by eminent domain, so we're going to be moving, and the new building's going to cost $9 million to construct. But we know it's worthwhile. Ouch. I don't have specifics on the cost, uh, but uh, we do have a lot of investments in laser buildings, uh, heavy duty lifts, and uh, all the equipment that is needed to work on heavy duty vehicles. And uh, we do um, we do have to purchase uh, testing equipments, which are very expensive. Um, for example, a 3D printer is almost thirty thirty five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. And we had to buy a uh, lot of different uh, equipment just for research and testing and uh, dynamometer, which is checks the vehicle performance and all need to be purchased and installed. And those are expensive, but I don't have the exact dollar value. Okay. But it's a significant part of the company's revenues that you're getting invested. Uh, fortunately for us, we have a long um, history mm -hmm. and we have accumulated a lot of equipment over a period of time. So I, I don't think it's significant revenue, okay. but uh, it, it is a significant amount. So. Okay. And it's on an ongoing basis. Yeah, that's it's what continuous you have to basis. Do. Yeah. Okay. Um, last question, and I'm going to start with Larry first. The process that you go through internally to make those decisions on what to purchase, what not to, can you talk a little bit about how you do that? Who's involved? The structure of our corporation is very unique. The, there is one gentleman that owns the company, and he actually isn't doing very well, so he doesn't really have any day-to-day -day operations. So it's really just a matter of myself and, and the top two people at New Tech where we brainstorm, see what things we need to do to increase the business and the sales and revenue, profits, and go after those markets. Um, some of our some of the things that we do to increase sales and revenue are not capital intensive. They might just be listening to our customers, and that's actually the way we have grown so much is just by listening to our customers and reacting to what they say. Our competitors don't listen to their customers. They just do the business they think their customers want. And they have completely missed out on a lot of the new medical devices that are not just medical devices, but also 
medical device with a drug or biologic, um, bioabsorbable, bioresorbables that can't take the normal sterilization methods. So listen to the customers. But as I said before, to when I decided to put in ETO, it meant going to the owner and the owner's family and convincing them with spreadsheets showing projected revenue and expenses that this would pay off in two years. In my prior life coming out of graduate school, I worked for, uh, I was an executive of Xerox Corporation and did a lot of financial planning and things like that for, for Xerox. And then switching over to uh, a much smaller company, but also owning the company, I don't do all that work anymore. I don't do all that financial planning. I don't worry about my ROI. Uh, what we look at is what capabilities do we need? What capabilities are we missing to allow us to continue to grow and sat satisfy our customers' needs? And once we identify what that is, then we just find the best box for that application, uh, at least the one we feel is the best, and then we, we buy it. I mean, uh, I don't have to go through that whole process of, uh, that you're talking about. I, I kind of do that in my head, and I just go, okay, it's, yeah, we need this capability, let's buy the machinery. You just need to convince yourself. And I've got, I've got, I've got friends at the bank, and um, somehow they like to loan me money, and I like to pay it back, and... and Sounds like a good way to make friends. Yeah. <laughs> Especially the paying back part. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we are also a privately owned company, uh, so all the decisions are made by the president of the company. But uh, we, I do have to go through and provide all the cost justification. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's, again, based on uh, customer demands. Uh, we, our customers are uh, transit agencies, private universities, and fleets which have a varied uh, requirements. So a, a customer A will have a totally different bus requirement. And you, when you see a bus, you don't think, oh, it's all the same. But it's actually 50% is different than uh, between the buses. So we do uh, take projects which are in our area of expertise. And, uh, and I think uh, the investment is made based on future projections of what customer demands are for next year and uh, what regulate, regulatory updates are coming for. So our industry is heavily regulated by APTA and uh, other FDA standards. So we have to upgrade and keep up with all the regulations. Mm -hmm. And decisions are made based on that. Okay. Great. Peter, I'm going to turn it over to you to provide that inside outside perspective on what you've heard in the last okay. few minutes. Well, certainly. Uh, if I could regale you with some stories about my former uh, career hold, back hold at the, the job shop. Up. Sorry, back at the job shop, I probably wouldn't be here right now because I would be innovating so much back there that this, it, I wouldn't be moving to Southern California. But I would say that the first, uh, as business owners and business leaders, the first thing that we have to do with our people internally is lead them. We have to give them the permission to innovate. We have to give them license to think differently. We have to encourage that. As far as what to innovate, as far as what to do, you have to develop some kind of an innovation team within your, within your company. Task them to go out and do some market research. Take a look at the market. Take a look at the competitors. What are they doing? What other vertical markets can we get in to service our, uh, our clients and clients that we don't yet have? What are our present customers saying? That's probably the most important thing. Innovation is not about making the new gadget. It's about making something that's new to you and new to your customers. It doesn't have to be the, uh, uh, a world beater. It just has to be something new. Your customers want to solve a problem. How can you take that problem and develop a product or service that solves that problem? Do some insight mining. Find out what they need. Do some, uh, some tech mining. Find out what is out there as far as technology. How can you... Uh, how can you integrate that into your manufacturing process, or how can you use that to develop a new product or service? What these guys have all been saying is that they've done some amount of research before they've come in, or before they went and uh, spent all the dollars. They figured out what the need is, who that is. People buy because of pleasure or pain. You're, you're either uh, pleasing someone with your, with your product, or you're solving some kind of product, or some kind of problem. That is inherent in all good innovations. What we call it is meaningfully unique. Whatever we develop has to be meaningfully unique, meaningful to the customer and unique, so not, any, not everybody else is doing it. So once we can understand that, we have that need, we have that pull, then we can start innovating new products. 
We have these little things called critical innovation themes. We know what we want to be in this industry. We know we can use this technology. But what is it that we're making? Let's brainstorm it. Once we start to brainstorm it, we have these themes and we bring in another, some more people to help us innovate. We have lists of ideas, whether they're products or services that we can help, that we can use to innovate in our own companies. Once we have that list of ideas, we prioritize. And then we run it through a system, a commercialization product development system that cuts down the time of taking our product or service to market. And many of what, what these gentlemen are talking about, they've done something very similar. Perhaps it wasn't a new product, maybe it was a technology like in Ken's case, but I guarantee you Ken went out there and, and polled his customers, found out what their needs were, and then developed a solution for those needs. That's innovation. It's not what we do, it's what they need. And if we can capture that and internalize it and work with our team and give them permission to create something that's meaningful, unique to our customers, then that's when we're innovating. That's when we're gonna create jobs. That's where we're gonna keep innovation here in Southern California and in the United States in general. It's up to us. That's our middle class. And we've been losing our middle class because manufacturing is going away. We can get it back as long as we have the right mindset. It's our responsibility, I feel, in some, it's certainly my responsibility as a consultant working for CMTC to impart this kind of awareness in, in, into the companies that we serve. Great. Thank you, Peter. And certainly the last point, that, that manufacturing matters. It's important to me. It's important to the Manufacturing Extension Partnership as the only really manufacturing focused program in the federal government we need to have manufacturing in this country this question is uh, primarily uh, for Ken and Larry uh, I'm I'm uh, curious about the equipment that you had made in Italy and the equipment that you bought uh, Larry but primarily Ken how much uh, input did you give to the machine manufacturer to uh, customize the equipment for your application or was it off the shelf and a follow-up question then is is um, why did you decide on an Italian manufacturer instead of a uh, someone domestically uh, great question in the brush business there's actually three countries where you can buy from within those three there's only three companies one is in Belgium one is in Germany and one is in Italy there used to be a leading company in the United States but they didn't heed some of the wisdom they should have heeded, and uh, they went from being a primary force to being out of business. So we don't have anybody domestically to buy from. So we went to all three of those companies, and we had them give us, you know, we, we gave them our requirements uh, with, with sample products and everything, and then they came back to us with their quotations, and we went with what was not the cheapest quotation, but for the best machine. Because what we care about is always the machine that's gonna last us for the longest time and going to give us the durability and the reliability. Uh, we have experience with all three of the companies. I have machinery from all three companies. We opted for the best one. The other Italian machine, this uh, CNC router, um, there was a US machine uh, that we went and looked at because I would have preferred to have bought the US made machine. Uh, but in looking at what this Italian company offered, who we never heard of, before we went on this mission to find this machine, we didn't know any of these, these uh, the vendors. Uh, but when we looked at their, um, uh, went to their companies that were using their machines, the difference was buying a, um, uh, buying a, a Mercedes and buying a Yugo, the way that we viewed it. And we're not looking for the cheapest thing, we're looking for the best thing. Because we, we know that if we don't get the productivity that we really expect, we're in, we're in deep trouble. We also don't want reliability issues. We want machinery that's gonna work and work and work. And never, ever, do I worry about what the cost is? I worry about making sure I get the right machine for what we're looking for. The cost is almost irrelevant. And, and I, you know, my, my degree is in finance. <laughs> I know all about the finance stuff. <laughs> but the reality is an ROI, it's not, a, it's not important. What's important is which is the right machine for you to get for your application. Yeah, I think uh, primarily I was, I, thank you, I, and I, I agree. But I, one of the other things I was gonna, uh, main thing I wanted to ask, was where were you and your company at in 
from a blank sheet of paper for a machine to an off-the-shelf machine, and what kind of process did you use to make sure that they got you a machine that satisfied your specific requirements? Well, we have very good relationships with our other brush, the, the companies that make, make the brush making machinery. And so in this particular case, we had the president of the company, his chief machine designer, as well as his chief software designer in our factory. And they spent three days with us studying our other machinery because we wanted something that was similar to what we had before. And so they, spend, they sent their, their top people to understand what we were doing and what we wanted to do better than what we were currently doing. And frankly, here's where uh, opportunities are lost. The German company, we bought a machine from them uh, in 2001. We went to them and said, we want to buy the exact same machine. We want just you know, a newer, modern version of it, but we want to buy the same machine to make these products because we love their machine. They told us, sorry, we don't make that model anymore. Instead, you have to buy this one. And what they wanted us to do was buy a, a tank to make a brush that would be used that was so much smaller. And we said, it's not the right machine. But they wouldn't make what we wanted any longer. And the US representative was very disappointed because he had us and another company that wanted to buy that same machine, which is a heck of a machine. But they wouldn't make it for us. So they put themselves out of competition. And the Belgium company, where we have had great success with machinery, they changed their strategy. They took all their spare parts and all their, their human know-how and moved it all back to Belgium. We need a part, we have to get it from Belgium. Well, that doesn't work very well when you're making things in America and machines run 24 hours a day and it goes down. And it takes you a week to get that part in by the time you identify what the part is. The Italian company in Maryland, had, they have their facility, they have trained people on how to help, help us fix things, and they have um, um, uh, spare parts there. So most often than not, we can get what we need tomorrow. It's a big difference for us when we're running 24 hours a day. You know, it's amazing that you had mentioned that about the Belgium machine. We also had three different machines that we could choose from. The $6 million we're about to invest for new machines. A Belgium company, a Canadian company, and a company that's only 10 miles from us. The Belgium company is exactly the same thing. They only have parts in Belgium. And if a machine goes down, you can't wait to have the, pro the parts sent to you. The company that, that manufactured our existing machines is in Canada, in Ottawa. And over the last seven years, we have not been down for more than a half a day because they can get the parts and fly the mechanic out to us, the technician, and immediately and have the product, I mean, have our machines back up. Whereas the company that's only 10 miles away their machines have been known to go down in the industry um, and could be down for a month at a time. And that just won't work at all, you know, when you have customers that need their product immediately. We have some of our customers that pay for a one-hour rush that is, um, instead of $500 for a box, it's $3,000 for a box. And so that's how important it is in, in my industry to have it in one hour versus in two days. And then about the... You had asked also about the design of the machines. Our existing machines can do a certain number of things, and we've decided through talking to our customers that there are other things that we could do better if we had more capabilities on these machines. So we have gone to the manufacturer, and he has agreed to design in three specific things so that now we can compete with the gamma market, which is almost triple what our EB market is. Great, thank you both. You know, Do we I just wanted to add one more? other thing, because we talk about having parts available. Everybody wants it now. They want it to, right now. I mean, everybody grab out their smart, grabs their smartphone, they look at it, they want the instant, instant gratification, they want their answer now. Um, by investing all this money in the machinery, in my machine shop and my brush making capabilities, we turn out products that are customized. And we've sent brushes to the moon, we've sent brushes to Mars, they've gone, been used on the space shuttle and all kinds of other things. But we can do it from start to finish in two to three weeks. Our competitors will take four to six weeks to get the parts from their machine shops, then it'll take them three or four weeks for them to do it themselves. And you know, we give them a finished product so quickly. I mean, I remember when we were working on the one from Mars, the uh, engineer from JPL would come to our factory, stand there, we'd do it while he waited 
because we wanted to help him make his Mars mission. You know, there's a deadline, and, and we, we wanted to be helpful. Anyway. Um, we have time for one more back there's here. There's a uh, lot of complaint about uh, regulation in California, and I'm just, this question is for Nikhil. How, how much um, of the business that your company does in, in um, switching to electric bus, first to CNG and then to electric buses, how much of that is thanks to the tough regulations in California which are promoting um, cleaner air and um, electric transportation? Uh, not, uh, we haven't sold any electric bus in California yet um, because again the regulations, uh, they, they, f they allow electric buses but they don't yet allow remanufacturing and there are definitions which they are not clear about. So we are working with it. Um, I think uh, we will have this resolved uh, this year for sure. And uh, then we will be able to uh, go out and start selling. Uh, there are some private customers uh, we are talking to which don't have the same constraints. And our cost proposition has been very effective. We are only 15% more in cost than a brand new diesel bus. And uh, so electric vehicle, completely zero emission, low maintenance, and just 15% more than diesel, it's, it's, forget about incentives, it's a no-brainer for even private companies. So we are talking to uh, private fleets and they are adopting and we are doing a few interesting projects with them, demonstrating the technology because they want validation and one year of testing before they go and deploy it as a fleet vehicle. So. Thank you, Nikhil. Yeah. Rob's coming to chase me off the stage, so let's thank our panelists.